Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our continued conversation, um, the topic of who is my neighbor? Uh, Pastor Matt Paul from First Presbyterian Church, and uh, trying to manage the uh, waiting room here while I'm talking at the same time. I think what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Nancy uh, in, to um, Nancy, if you wouldn't mind opening us in prayer, actually, and then introducing our guests. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn a little bit more about some of our neighbors, neighbors that perhaps we don't get to visit with or talk with very often, but we know that they are needy. And Jesus tells us that we must care for the needy. So be with us this night that our conversation might please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tonight our, our topic is uh, focusing a little more on the area of homelessness, although as we found in our conversation, uh, things kind of mold together a little bit between conversations about mental illness and homelessness, uh, the criminal justice system, as well as addiction and, and other issues. So um, Nancy, um, turn it back over to you. Thanks. A um, little bit about our two guests this evening. First one is Lisa Lyon. Lisa is the program director of Lutheran Community Services Northwest right here in Port Angeles. Lisa has been with the agency for about 20 years and she's worked with all different kinds of people. Before she came to Lutheran Social Services, she worked with developmentally disabled adults and children. Um, she's worked with drug court, working with chemically dependent. Um, she's taught parenting classes um, and now runs a family center that is located at um, public housing, Mount Angeles View, used to be called The Projects. So Lisa will be with us tonight to specifically talk about um, the work that she's doing with homelessness. And then we have Viola Ware, who is also with us tonight. She is from the Rediscovery Program, and I warned Viola that in every session, um, Rediscovery came up. So she, she has to um, tell us all what this group really is doing. Um, Viola has just recently, on Valentine's Day, been appointed by the governor to the Office of Homeless Youth Prevention and Protection Programs Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. So we really thank you that you took time, since you're a celebrity now, to be with us tonight. Viola also has worked with the um, Port Angeles Police Department and she received the Citizens Service Medal in 2017. She worked for 10 years in community corrections in Seattle. She's worked with the homeless population in Clown County for nine years in various and sundry um, activities. Right now, her, her title is, and I had to look at this several times thinking, uh, maybe there is a typo in here. She is the coordinator of arrest and jail alternative case management. And she goes hiking with a medical team member and a housing specialist, taking professional services right to the needy. So for both of you, I'm gonna start with a question that is not directed at just one of you, but at both of you. And then we'll kind of divide up and I'll ask each of you separate questions about your program. Um, in the last two weeks, we've mostly been talking about mental health and homelessness. And last week, the Sheriff's Department indicated to us that about 95% of the homeless on the street are mentally ill. And that took a lot of us by surprise, I believe. Um, but I happen to know, having worked with homeless for a while, that um, all homelessness 
is not a result of mental illness. So both Viola and Lisa, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what brings people to homelessness. Lisa, how about you first? Sure. Um, so in the work that we do, um, we operate a family center, um, like Nancy said here locally. And so we offer some family support model services, really basic needs, crisis intervention kinds of services. And so when we interact with folks who are homeless and learn about their story and, and collectively put together a plan to get them out of their situation, um, we, hear, we see and hear quite the opposite of those folks who I believe Viola really interacts with daily. So the families and individuals that we see um, are living in cars, they're in hotels, um, they're couch surfing from place to place. Um, oftentimes brought to homelessness because of a tragic event. They've lost a job or income, um, a relationship issue, domestic violence or a relationship um, loss. Um, they moved to the area to care for a family member. Family member either passes on or no longer need that care, and, and they find themselves stuck. Um, so the population we see is quite different than what um, police chief would talk about. Um, you know, the homeless population that we see on the street and the mental health issues. Of course, we see those issues. Um, those are some barriers that people bring to the table that keeps them in homelessness. Substance use disorders um, are the same. Um, but the root cause of their homelessness is not the mental health or is not the, the substance use issue. Do you see children? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we see families who are living in cars, tents, again, hotels. Um, I would say the majority of our um, folks that we see and help um, are our families. With kids of all ages, I suppose. All ages, all ages. We have. A, I, I'm working with a mom right now. Um, she's a single mom, and she has a five month old, and they're living in a car. Wow. So it spans the gamut of age. Okay, thanks, Viola. What about the people that are that you run into daily? Um, is the ninety five percent mentally ill a good number? Um, I'm not sure if I would say that because the people I interact with all kinds of people and I have, and if I could just give a little bit of background and give some statistics, please, um, the number, uh, main cause of homelessness, if we really want to look at our systems is lack of affordable housing right now, the two bedroom across the way from me, and this is in an old building built in 1917, um, is renting for 1200 a month. Um, you can't pay for that off of our new minimum wage of $15 an hour, right? And support your family. Plus you have to go into it earning more than three times the rent. Almost, it, I, you're gonna have a hard time finding somebody um, to do that. Also, one of the main predictors of um, how long-term housing instability is trauma symptom severity and low self-esteem. When I worked in housing, one of the most common things that happened, we would ask people, what are your strengths? Almost everybody went, I don't know, right? These are people that have been beaten down for a long time. Um, also, number one cause of homelessness for women is domestic violence. Um, about 40% of the homeless in our state are children. So the people that we come in contact to who are on the street that we say that, you know, maybe talking to themselves, looking disheveled, that is a small percentage um, of our homeless population. And what I'm finding out there is that if they were in crisis, the extended time homeless um, has exacerbated any issues that they have. And there is a lot of homeless programs are built around what's called housing first, because <clears throat> it's the understanding that unless somebody gets housed, it's really difficult to expect them to get better and to get um, and to heal, right? Emotionally and mentally when they're constantly being re-traumatized out there. Every time somebody is asked to move their tent or move their vehicle to a place that they don't know where they're gonna be, 
um, it causes more trauma. And they get frequently victimized while they're out there, either by other people who are experiencing those issues or by um, community members um, coming up and pounding on the doors of their car and shooting fireworks at them um, or calling them horrible parents for being in the car with their children. And unfortunately, what has happened over time, especially since the pandemic, um, when all the lockdowns happened and the eviction moratorium happened, the state said, oh my goodness, we are gonna have a flood of new homelessness. And what used to be the priority was the folks that have been outside the longest because they are those that are at most risk of staying homeless or dying without housing intervention. But when the state saw that they were gonna have this flood of new homeless of people being evicted from their homes, they threw a lot of money and a lot of efforts to keep people in their homes. And so these folks that have been outside this whole time are still outside and they've been deprioritized. And what's happened is also all these different programs that help them went on lockdown and they couldn't access them. And you couldn't access them without a phone, without access to internet. And even the shelters did not install new phones or those systems didn't put phone kiosks outside or computer kiosks outside. So there's times I'll be there where I have to spend an entire day with one person just to apply for food stamps and to get started on disability with, I have one phone with the social security office on hold and another phone on hold with DSHS. And we're just sitting on hold and hopefully the people on the other end of the line are gonna be nice. It's, it's been a challenge. <laughs> Thanks Vail, we'll come back to you in a little bit. So don't disappear or anything, okay? <laughs> Um, Lisa, what, so you get these families basically that, how, how do they get to you? What's a so, referral source? So we have many, um, we're a small community. Um, we have great partners in the community and we work closely together. Um, for instance, when rediscovery comes across somebody that could really use some assistance with housing or they have kids involved, um, they'll do a direct referral for services. Other referrals come in just by word of mouth. So in our center, we have a food pantry. We have personal care items. We have public access computers. And so all of those things um, people can come in to use. And as we meet people and we meet their most immediate need, whatever they come in the door, it gives us an opportunity for more conversation about what their overall life looks like and what their needs might be. And so referral sources come from a variety of places, um, relationships with partners, school district, first step, um, doctor's clinics, the pediatrician's clinics um, are referral sources and other service providers that are trying to do similar work. Housing, um, again, rediscovery, do you have places to put them? Is there housing available for the people that you're getting? Housing's really hard. Um, there's just not a lot of availability um, for anybody in our community, um, whether you find yourself homeless or not. There's just not enough inventory of housing available. Um, so it is really hard. Um, so we, we um, are in the middle of public housing um, Peninsula Housing Authority um, offers us space. Um, we have an MOU agreement with them. So a, a couple of years ago, they began a, a project of redevelopment of their property. It was a 100 unit um, family public housing. What Nancy said, it was referred to as the projects. They embarked on a 10 year plan to redevelop the property so that it was multi-income, multi-use property, meaning folks who, who weren't low income could have a home on the property. There would be senior, um, senior residents on the property. Again, it was a 10-year plan. We're probably in year 12 or 14. Um, and they've had three phases and they've completed one where they took out 60 units um, and built 80 units of family housing. So in our MOU agreement, they have some units that are set aside for homeless families. And so we have direct access to those units as they become available. 
there's probably four or five agencies locally that have those MOU agreements. And so as units um, become available, it's like a horse race to the finish line because it's based on a first come first serve rather than a wait list. Um, so we do have some availability. Um, those units came online in 2018. And I think to date, we've probably housed about 25 families. Um, right as we speak, we're in the process of doing three more. Lisa, tell us what an MOU is. So an MOU is a, a memorandum of understanding. And so it's really just a partnership um, with Lutheran Community Services, the other um, partner agencies and Peninsula Housing Authority that says, we're going to work together and we're going to figure out how to house some of these hard to house families who may not have rental history, they might, might not have much income, they have other barriers to be successfully housed. Um, and those agencies that have those MOU agreements agree that when they house these families, it's our role really to, to help those families with a housing success plan, meaning family management stuff. What kinds of barriers come along for them that could impact their ability to stay housed? Lisa, I just asked Viola some questions. Mute, mute your, thank you. The grandchild is playing in the background. <laughs> Viola, it appears that we've got um, homeless people that are being cared for well through Lisa's program. We've got the street people. Um, what are the numbers showing? Um, how, many, how many homeless do you think there are? Um, so in my work, um, I work in a team of where there's two main functions. So I am the case management piece and then we have the outreach piece and we kind of feed into each other. So outreach can refer to me. I get referrals from law enforcement. Um, I get referrals from the jail. I get referrals from the fire department and then from our own team. Um, intensive case management, usually we keep about 20, but um, I believe at the last, um, count we were at 150 to 175 Lisa correct me if I'm wrong uh, but I think it was around there and as far as I know because of the pandemic that number has held pretty steady um, and I don't know if you know what the point in time count is okay so um, yeah that's that's what we're seeing and I've had some success really kind of working with um, housing programs and kind of massaging the processes to get people into permanent housing. It's taken over a year in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, I had one, uh, I think in the, in the beginning of December, we housed um, six, six households, 11 people. So that, uh, that included a two and three year old child. And that put to rest about a hundred years altogether of homelessness. Viola, we're going to back up a step and just really briefly tell the folks what what's the mission of rediscovery. And I know that's kind of hard because you. Well, I know what you do, and yeah, I, it gives me a headache. <laughs> so, so we really are gap fillers. So we are there to help sort of bring all the resources. We're not siloed. So when somebody works with us. They work with all of our partnerships. And so that would be people like Lisa and that would be Housing Authority. That would be um, Serenity House. It would be Peninsula Behavioral Health and the PATH program. So um, really our intent, we, uh, so we have the mental health field response that's with outreach. Um, and that's just going out and loving on people. And, and providing that trust and getting them to a place where they feel comfortable that they're back trusting the system and um, are motivated to work on change. With my program, it's people that need a little more um, aggressive engagement. And it's for folks who have a history of law enforcement engagement and who may be engaged more in the future if we don't come in 
um, with this intensive case management and services and to get folks stabilized. And it's really working with them. And most folks know what they need. Um, they just need somebody willing to sit down and take the time and learn their language and um, help them see that it isn't impossible. You have quite a collaboration of agencies that work with you and even walk the streets with, yeah. with your team. Tell us a little bit about the involvement of law enforcement, fire department. Um, are they actually hiking the trails with you? Oh, yeah. So it's uh, at any given time, there may be one of us actually in a squad car with somebody or with the fire department. Um, and then I've had the fire department come with me. Um, there are times where I run into somebody who's been trespassed. Like just recently, they were trespassed from the transit center. They had an injury. Um, that was pretty serious. And I was able to call our community paramedic partner who sent somebody down right away and helped um, assess their injury and then transport them uh, and sit with them while they were um, at the walking clinic and then to the ER. Um, and then because we're based out of what was VMO, so we have a volunteer doctor and a medical assistant who I'm after this meeting, I'll be with them tonight over at the shelter clinics where we provide either testing, vaccinations, address any medical needs. We also have a psych nurse who is able to uh, provide any kind of mental health emergency medical. Um, and then we just received a new grant and we will be going into the jail and connecting with folks, providing them with mental health and medication and a better transition coming out so that they have a. Great. So what really is the goal then of, of rediscovery? It's multi-pronged. <laughs> it's to help people achieve efficient. Um, and keep them safe and alive, but also to relieve our emergency response systems. So okay. it's to allow the police to not have to subsidize um, our homeless folks that are out there and respond as much or um, high utilizers of 911. Um, and people, these folks outside and also there are some folks in their homes that we um, go with the fire department too. Um, tend to um, be in the ER for much longer um, and they tend to avoid medical appointments. Um, and so their, their issues get much worse and then they end up in the ER um, and with really chronic issues. So we do a lot of like catch it, go chasing down somebody who's living outside and making sure that we pick them up and take them to their doctor's appointments. Okay, um, perfect. So. Um, here's a biggie kind of question for both of you. Um, the, the disgruntled people that think we are um, enabling the homeless by offering them services. You've heard it before. Lisa's heard it before. I certainly heard it when Lisa and I were working together. Um, by offering them food, shelter, housing, a loving heart. <laughs> I'm gonna use this example. Um, I live in a building that's um, next to one of the bridges. And there was a couple that lived <clears throat> under the bridge. There's always people that come and go from there. Um, and there was a couple down there. And one day I made too much soup. And I thought, well, it's cold out. So I took them a little Tupperware container of soup. And I said, listen, I made too much soup. Here's some soup. Years later, they still told that story with tears mm -hmm. in their eyes. And they said that was the motivation for them to change their lives because somebody treated them like a human being. Lisa, are you an, an enabler? It depends who you ask, right? <laughs> Um, we are not. So our program really is, it's a grassroots program. Family support has been around for over 20 years. It really is built to be a prevention 
program. Um, and it's about self-sufficiency, right? So when you have so many crisis and trauma in your life, it's hard to sort out what's next for yourself. And so our services really, really look at that holistic picture of somebody rather than one issue, whether it be mental health, homelessness, whatever, um, and help them set those goals to get out of the situation that they're in. Sometimes it's a simple fix and sometimes of course it's much more complicated. Um, we don't see ourselves as being enabling. Um, we see our ourselves as giving people an opportunity um, to make their lives better. A and we can be pretty creative about what that looks like. Um, and again, having a family center, <clears throat> it allows us opportunities for folks to come in and do laundry if they need to go to a job interview or if they're meeting somebody um, for housing and they just don't have laundry because they're living in a car or, um, you know, those self-sufficiency things that people think, you know, you just, you know, pull up your bootstraps and you move on with life. And it's not always easy, it, easy to do that. And so, you know, our services really are about prevention and self-sufficiency. Well, both of you, for goodness sakes, why don't they just go get a job? Wouldn't that just solve the problem? Right. What's the matter with those people? What are you going to tell me when I oh, say something goodness. like that? <laughs> well, you know, I may ask somebody to um, not wash their clothes and not bathe for a week and <laughs> sit by a campfire and then go into a job interview and see how Good. successful that is. <laughs> Well, and I guess my comments would be, it's, it's really hard to get a job when you live in a car, you may or may not have an alarm clock. Like Viola said, you, you have no way to wash clothes, be appropriate for a job interview. You may not have eaten for a couple of days. And so it's really distracting to go to a job interview and all you can think about is I'm starving and I hope my stomach doesn't make weird noises, right? So there's lots of, lots of opportunities for conversations with people and people tell me that often. It's like, well, why can't they just get a job like the rest of us? Okay. And then we go into <laughs> conversations like, well, you know, we're serving families who are working full time, full time, but at $15 an hour, there's no way you're going to be able to aff afford housing. And so it snowballs. If you're making $15 an hour, you can't either find or afford housing, but you're in a hotel that leaves you $0 left after paying for a hotel, hopefully for an entire week, right? Um, and, and to be able to get out there and get a job. You just can't be dependable um, when you're trying to just survive. How, how much is childcare these days? A lot and it's not available right um so there's there's huge wait lists um so an example for, for you know true to my life so i have a three-year-old granddaughter who lives with me um we are very fortunate she's got child care and it costs twelve hundred dollars a month mm -hmm. um so unless families are making a ton of money that can pay for that or they have the resources to help them find subsidized childcare or apply for subsidized childcare. Um, it's just, it's out of reach for families, um, let alone the wait list or the unavailability um, because we have a childcare crisis in our community. There's not enough available. And there's also the aspect of transportation. So if you don't have a car, the buses don't run on holidays. They don't run on Sundays. And then they don't run in the evenings. And so people, you know, sometimes will get a car and drive without a license and without insurance just so they're available to get a job, those entry level jobs that you have to be available 24 seven. And sometimes you have employers that will call you at the last minute and make you come in or threaten you with losing your job. And I worked with a woman when I first moved into town who um, was pregnant and worked at Walmart. And she was so afraid to refuse any hours because if you limit your hours, you're told you're not going to get any, that she walked home at 1130 at night from Walmart. Mm -hmm. And even if it, it, you get your first month's paycheck and that's not enough to get you out of that tent that's uh, down on the waterfront trail, it's gonna be a while before you can even afford any kind of housing if you can find it. 
Oh, well, it is. I mean, Viola mentioned it earlier. You know, most um, rentals these days, you have to prove that you make at least three times the amount mm -hmm. of what the rent is. And rents are going for, you know, $1,500 a month. So that means that you need to be able to earn $4,500 a month minimum to be even, even remotely looked at for that rental. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to come up with first, last, and deposits. And so... Again, um, most people who do work, it's, you know, $5,000 is hard to come up with to move. So there's just lots of barriers out there that keep people where they're at. Yeah. And oftentimes, if you come with it, so Washington State has laws that if you do have a subsidy assisting you with your rent, the landlord has to consider that part of your income. They cannot discriminate, but we do not have a robust tenants union here which means it happens often and um, people just don't get the rentals even if they have a subsidy or even a section eight. Yeah, right. So Viola, in your program, what, what do you consider a success at the end of the day? Oh my goodness. Um, so, uh, success can take so many forms mm -hmm. right for some people it's that somebody decided not to use that day right it could be that somebody decided to um accept a antipsychotic medication that is going to change their lives um it could be that somebody who five years ago i was finding at a campsite um, up to their knees in garbage got housed and has been clean for a year. Um, I think success isn't, doesn't follow traditional ideals of success. And I think mm -hmm. we have to start thinking of it differently. Just like, I think we have to start thinking of what being housed is differently because I have met enough returning veterans from places like Afghanistan who feel the safest in a vehicle with wheels. And they can't get their their homes funded because it's not con it's they're still considered homeless. Right. Now we mentioned Sarge's place and what's happening in the West End a little bit last week. I'm sorry that we didn't have time in this series to um, include them as a speaker because they've really done an amazing job for the veterans in the West End. So Lisa, what's What's a success for you at the end of the day? So we take success as little wins, right? And our, our success really is a success for the family. And it might be something as simple as somebody was able to walk out the door with a bag of groceries so that they could feed their kids for a couple of days until they could get food stamps because we just applied. Or they could come into our center and sit for an hour and be warm have a cup of coffee, coffee, maybe some soup, and just talk about their life and, and what's next for them and, and the struggle that they have and how we can help with that. Those are wins. Um, a, a, certainly a win is if somebody's housed, we celebrate those hard just because, just because they, you know, it takes a lot of work to get people housed. And, you know, as a community, whether you have trauma or substance use or mental health, um, Housing's hard, period. So mm -hmm. wins take a lot of different forms like Viola talks about. It may be a mom who was freaking out because they didn't have diapers to get them through the day and they walked out the door with diapers. And so um, we celebrate every little win and certainly the big wins. Um, we're loud about those. Yeah. <laughs> I want to come be loud with you. I'm not allowed <laughs> to do that around here. Sorry. <laughs> So what haven't I asked you that you just really need to get out there? Viola, anything? Um, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I've learned over time that for me is very, very important um, is learning to listen to people. And the other piece that's really important uh, within that is learning to listen to people that sound angry. <laughs> because anger is the volume of people who feel unheard. 
It's the language of trauma and oppression and feeling forgotten by the system. And I think it's really important in our line of work to allow people to teach us how to listen to them because everybody has their realm of authority that they're coming from, from their lives. And they have an awful lot to teach us. That trauma issue just is repeated and repeated and repeated, not only on this series of forums, but in people's lives, in their families. Mm -hmm. Lisa, what did I not ask you? So I think that our message, when we talk about prevention and self-sufficiency and the work that we do in family support, I think the message that we try and um, give to folks who, whether they ask or not, um, I, I will certainly talk a lot about what we do because I, I'm pretty passionate about that, is just to think about their own lives and some of the struggles that they've endured and to be kind to people along the way. You know, listen to what people need. Don't assume that we, because we're social service folks, are going to fix them or rescue them. That's not our goal. Um, our goal is to figure out how we can best support somebody in their own goals, whatever that might be. And so, you know, I, I spend a lot of time talking to people who get angry about you know, people who are homeless or how much money it costs or how much money our program gets. Um, just to think about, um, you know, who the people that you come across in, in your day, be kind to them. Don't assume things about them and certainly don't judge them. So those are my messages. Good ones too. Thanks both of you. I think Pastor Matt's going to take it from here. I don't know about taking it from here necessarily, but I did open it up for, for questions. So if you have a, a question for um, Viola or Lisa, uh, you can use the raised hand function or the, uh, the, chat, uh, the chat feature. I, I do have a follow-up question, I guess, about... Um, I don't know, the homeless that we, you know, that we see maybe, uh, I, I see some people on the street, for instance, um, daily, uh, but, and, and some that I know that are out, out and about in the community, they're not necessarily homeless, but they, they just spend their time um, out, um, you know, during the day, um, out maybe by, a, you know, Veterans Park or something like that up and down Lincoln. Um, but I don't know. It seems to me that as we're having the discussion, there's so many people that we don't necessarily see that are couch surfing or, um, you know, living in their cars. Um, I don't know if you could say more about, uh, about the people that we see that, that we, and that we don't see. I, I think I'll stop there. Any. Um, it's a broad subject. So a lot of the folks that are seeing are being um, actively worked with um, often. They're often, in, most of the times if we get a phone call and we invite phone calls if anybody thinks or sees somebody that they think is in danger or um, they've seen out there a lot. Um, most times we know exactly who it is. We've had multiple contacts with them. Um, and it's, it, what we do is person-centered. So um, if I push somebody into treatment or if I push somebody into something that I think that they need, that becomes my treatment. That becomes my program. And it's not going to stick and change is not going to happen. And especially change for our community. Um, so a lot of it is a, like the person I talked about, it was five years <clears throat> getting from a point of them being in a campsite to, and what triggered it was I had actually worked with them before and I was able to tell them kind of in a moment where they were upset and they're like, nobody wants to talk to me unless I want to talk about treatment, but nobody talks to me about housing. I said, okay, let's talk about housing. And then they were like, well, I don't know if I'm ready. I was like, 
that's okay. Let's just get you signed up. And then when you're ready, your name's going to be in it and we'll be good to go. And I was able to tell them, you know, I know who you are. I know where you've been and I know what you are capable of. Um, and oftentimes it's making room for hope for some folks, but we also, I think it's important that we understand that there is free will and we all have a right to it, no matter what. Um, I do um, understand, and I did when I did my walks with PAPD back in 2016, I do understand the concerns of the community. And I've never asked anybody or any business to give up their safety you know, there's oftentimes conversations that we do have with people that's like, hey, you know, let's help you get, you know, I'll bring bags of garbage bags. Let's help you get cleaned up, you know, you or encouraging people not to trespass. But at the same time, um, we have a system where a shelter um, maybe have laid punitive measures based on somebody having too much property. Mm -hmm. And they're being banned for 30 days because of one extra bag of property. Yeah. Um, and then the police come in contact with them because they're sleeping in a place that nobody wants them to sleep in. And then the police have nowhere to send them. And um, what is left is trying to reach out to full shelters out of county, which I think is really a disservice to our community members. Um, Uh, Viola, what's a section eight? Oh, that is a uh, voucher from housing authority that based on your income will pay your rent. Thank you. Yeah. Wayne? Do you find um, once you get people housed, uh, kind of what happens then? Is the housing you get them temporary until they become more self-sufficient? Do things start falling in place for them? Job, you know, stability, what we would normally consider stability. Does that tend to follow or do you have any kind of long-term follow-up with those people that get housed? The research indicates if you take somebody without any case management, if you take somebody from the street and plunk them into housing, it takes two years to stabilize because once they're in a place where there's not a bunch of noise, they're not solely focused on what am I going to eat? How am I going to stay safe? How am I going to stay warm? Um, a lot of that trauma bubbles to the surface. Mm -hmm. And there are times where we've actually housed people and they are, they don't even sleep in the bed. They're so not used to having a bed. I um, had somebody who was homeless for about 20 years that um, we were able to get through how, and they've nearly given up. They told me as we were driving them to their lease signing, they were like, I was going to end it all. Um, I was ready. I was done. And when we got them in, one of the things that we do is like, okay, what's one thing that's going to make it home? We'll get it for you. And they asked for a bed, but they were like, just nothing too soft because it hurts my back because they slept on the ground for so long. So <laughs> there's it, people do stabilize. That individual is super happy now. Every time I see them, they tell me um, I'm a happy person. They've like, covered their door in drawings of rainbows and hearts and music and <laughs> um but things do crop up and it may take a minute so there's always we always leave the engagement door open so that as things come up and as other crises crop up but yeah people start engaging with their medical care um and you know they start realizing there's hope for more so really it's kind of housing and I guess you would call it case management that seem to go hand in hand here to kind of move people towards stability. Is that a correct assumption? Yes. Okay, thanks. I do have another question, but I'll shut up and let somebody else ask. <laughs> I've not seen any other hands at the moment, Wayne, if you go oh. ahead. Oh. Sam has a hand. Oh. You're not, you, I can't, if you don't use the raised hand, I don't necessarily see you. So that's why I ask you to do that. But go ahead, Stan. Well, I do raise, I push the raised hand. It just doesn't stay there very long. Oh, you're, 
Yeah, okay, we'll talk about that. <laughs> there, there's oh, a... Regardless, we yeah. won't get into that one. Um, my, my question is really kind of a different focus. Both of you, Lisa and Viola, have been in this field for a long time. It's such a high stressed field. How do you guys survive? How, how, how do you survive it? How do you maintain any kind of sanity? So for me, um, so I've been with the agency again, almost 20 years and um, the work we do is hard. Um, because people's lives are hard um, and, and we walk that journey with them. And so for me, it's those little wins, right? It's, it's having somebody walk out the door knowing they're going to be fed today or their family's going to be fed today or that baby has diapers. Um, those are the things that keep me going. I'm pretty passionate about what we do. This is my community too. I've lived here for 35 years. I've raised my kids here. Now my grandkids are here. So it's important for me um, to have a healthy community. Um, and so I strive really hard at that. But the little wins is what keeps me going. Okay, thank you. It has been a particularly hard run for us in the last two years, just because of the vulnerability of the folks. We've lost more um, in the last two years than we have in the last 10. Mm -hmm. And um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit emotional. I normally don't. Um, <laughs> I've lost I, I've lost individuals that I've worked with for many years. And for me, it's um, not getting not allowing myself to get emotionally attached to the outcomes because people are people. They get to choose to do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, and it's knowing that I did my best and maybe even if their lives were very difficult, that I got to be a little bit of love in that life, regardless of who they were or where they came from. And then also just making sure that um, I feed my own life on the other end of it. So I go out and I hike and I get into the woods and I remind myself of who I am regularly. <laughs> well, thank you both for your work and for your sharing. And what could the faith community do to help you? Really, honestly, just doing what you're doing right now is, you know, learning about who our community is because they're still our community members. Um, and I don't know, maybe making some soup for somebody that uh, <laughs> is sitting on the corner. Yeah. So I think that there's um, a lot that faith communities can do that. Um, other programs or government agencies simply can't do because of bureaucracy or red tape. I mean, I think one great example is your congregation who allowed people to park their car um, on site and, and know that they had a safe place to be. Those kinds of actions um, are huge. Um, and those are things that neighborhoods don't aren't very willing to take up. Businesses certainly aren't willing to take up because there's a lot of liability to that and there's a lot of fear. So I think there's lots of efforts that faith-based um, communities can step up and do things that other folks either can't, won't, um, or, or can't afford. So I think there's lots of things to do. I think a good example of that is all of the housing work that's happening um, in Port Townsend with the tiny villages that they've built. A lot of that's been spurred and work done by faith-based um, participation. And so, I, again, I think that there's a lot of that that can happen. Like Viola said, make soup. You know, we have a, we have a food pantry. We have a personal care um, pantry. Um, we do a food event twice a month. We do diapers once a month um, to talk to people, um, to come and visit with people, learn their story, um, because there are community too. Do you both, um, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, consider yourself part of the mental health system, whatever that is. You know, I kind of grew up thinking mental health 
system was psychologists, psychiatrists, and and uh, psych wards in hospitals. I don't even think we have a psych ward in this town, do we? So I'm not quite sure. Are, are you mental health? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I mean, if so, what is it that you treat? Or are you more of a service provider of some sort? It sounds like social service may be more than mental health to me. I'm not sure. It's just a definition of terms. I've, I'm just looking for a little clarification here. I realize my definition is kind of small, but what would you call the mental health system in this county anyway? Mm. So everybody that on our team is trained as a um, crisis intervention specialist. So we do have that certification, but we are conduits into um, the mental health system. So we have a, um, we have what's called in a, a, a uh, I'm trying to think crisis response system that is, is uh, managed by uh, Peninsula Behavioral Health. Um, but then we also have like with us, we have our psych nurse. Um, so I would be the bridge to mental health services. Okay. If I was schizophrenic and hallucinating, where would I wind up? Well, that depends. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's hope that you would be able to access services um, through whoever out at PBH and get the necessary help that you need. That mm -hmm. isn't always the case if you can't keep appointments mm -hmm. or you act in a way that scares people. So um, there are individuals that we work with that we actually work in hand in hand with community paramedics that um, it took a long time to build an individual's trust who is um, schizoaffective um, and having delusions and administering some medication that turns somebody from yelling and screaming at people that aren't there to having a conversation like this. And then being able to work then towards housing and more. Okay. So Wayne, for for our program, um, we are not mental health specialists. Um, so the folks that we have on board, we are all um, trained in trauma informed care. Um, we're all trained in ACEs um, mm -hmm. that really bring people into crisis. Um, like my own background, um, I'm not a mental health provider. I'm not a, um, an MSW or social worker. My background is a bachelor in, in human development with a minor in family support studies. Um, like Viola, we're a bridge to that. Um, we don't provide the mental health services, but we help people get connected where they need to get connected when they're ready. Thanks. I'm just curious if you interact much with the schools. My wife is a paraeducator and I know that um, she has stories about some of the kids at school that uh, she knows are homeless and the, the challenges that, that they have and what the teachers and staff members do. Do you offer, um, have much interaction support with the, the schools? We do. Um, so we work closely with the navigators within the Port Angeles School District, um, who um, are the liaison for, for the McKinney Vento, so the homeless families. So we work really closely with the school district, not only in family support, um, but just looking at kiddos, social, emotional, behavioral health, and school readiness. Um, so the, I guess the short answer is yes, um, we do integrate with the school districts. Our agency actually does um, a, a large back to school event every fall. Um, and that really is to help support families um, who are low income, who, who can't purchase um, services and or supplies for their kiddos. Um, so yes, we do. We are only in the schools as necessary through case management or outreach. It's typically um, we are coordinating with um, family services that are in the schools. Okay. Well, I think Viola, you mentioned earlier uh, the count, homeless count, or something. What? What is? Can you explain that a little bit to everyone? The point in time count happens nationwide at the end of January. 
And it is an effort to try to count everybody who is sleeping outside. So the reason why it's January was chosen as a day is that it would be, if somebody's sleeping outside, it's because they had no other option. Hmm. And so it's just all service agencies and volunteers get together and go out for a night because we're a rural area. We're given about a week to be able to make this count. And it's to literally put eyes on and count every single person who is sleeping outside and unsheltered that night. Okay. Was the number 155 for the county? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will have to look up the exact number. Um, I can get it to you. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. And that point in time count is actually helping, happening next Thursday in our community. Oh. It was put out a little bit with COVID and that's a Department of Commerce you know they collect data across um, across the board about homelessness, and so this really addresses um, that. So it's next Thursday is when that happens. Seattle is a very interesting way of doing it. Um, Tim Harris rings a gong in front of City Hall for every person that's sleeping outside. Mm -hmm. And that's not including people that are in their cars then. Um, if you can identify people in their cars, so there's a specific, when you hear that there's terms, yeah. um, you have sheltered homeless and unsheltered homeless. So sheltered homeless are people who are in the shelter or in a, uh, a place where they can sleep for the night. Um, unsheltered would be those individuals who are in a car or outside or in a tent. Okay. Yeah. You know, I helped out with that two years ago. Uh, it was good. And it was sort of... Uh, Interesting, there's some, the training, you know, that goes along with that. I wasn't able to contribute much to the count. Nobody was in my area, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's where it can become kind of, as people are um, chased out of areas and they learn to hide really well. <laughs> We're about to the end of our time. Uh, Viola or Lisa, anything that you'd like to, uh, closing thoughts for us that you'd like to share? I don't think I have anything. I do appreciate allowing me to come and talk. I love talking about what we do. I love what I do. Uh -huh. um, ditto that for me. I, I love to talk about the work we do. Um, I guess in closing, I mean, I certainly appreciate um, your format to have these discussions in our community because it, again, it is our community. It's, uh, you know, it's where we all live. Um, and I would just welcome, you know, folks to come and see what we do and interact with the mm -hmm. folks that we serve and, and, and see what that is. I think that people have a vision in their head about, you know, our homeless population and they, you know, they either are sad or they're angry. Um, but we, we, we tell people come and see, because in reality, uh, you know, we're all just a paycheck away from being homeless ourselves, right? And so we, we ask people for that compassion and to be kind. Um, and again, we appreciate the work that you guys are doing in bringing this conversation um, up in our community, because it's um, not always a great top topic for people to take on. Thank you. Don, would you like to uh, tell us what, what we have on tap for next week? Next week, we have uh, the mayor of Port Angeles and the city manager of Port Angeles to talk to us and give us their um, sort of like politicians view of the problem that we've been talking about the last three weeks. Okay. Yeah, well, so we hear more about what's happening locally on kind of the policy front. So hope that uh, you'll join us for that. Um, as we've done each week, these are recorded and placed on uh, YouTube kind of as soon as possible. So maybe by tom tomorrow afternoon, even this will be available for anybody that hasn't joined us. So if you know of anyone that would like to see or be part of the conversation, you can direct them to our uh, YouTube channel. Um, Viola and Lisa, thank you again for joining us tonight and um, thank you all for joining. So we'll see you next week, hopefully.
Thank you. Thank you again for inviting Thank us. You. Thank you.